Um, the EcoDrive project is a, a three-year project funded by the uh, EU, which um, aims to encourage sort of collaboration between different research institutes in different countries. And in this particular project, we have a collaboration between ourselves, University of Yucatan in Mexico, University of Stellenbosch, South Africa, and also a research institute in Jordan and in uh, Spain, Extremadura, University of Extremadura. So there are five partners in collaboration. And we're very fortunate today to have four visitors come over from two of those partner countries. So uh, we have this morning um, speakers from Anna, Anna Novoa from Stellenbosch in South Africa and Peter Swanpol. From, did I yep. pronounce that right? Yeah. Right. <laughs> and Anna's going to talk about um, invasive species, especially the prickly cactus <laughs> variety um, and her experiences with that. And Peter's going to talk about um, soil fertility in pasture systems and uh, cropping systems. And then this afternoon we have our two Mexican visitors, uh, Javier Solorio Sanchez and Luis Ramirez Villas at the back of the room there. And uh, they're going to talk about agro-silver pastoral systems, so like, uh, sort of livestock systems, sustainable livestock systems in, in their part of the world. There's going to be a lunch break from um, 12 to 1, where you'll have a chance to chat and see what it's like. We, for, for those of uh, you here who are employed by Coventry University, you are eligible to travel with this project to some of those partner countries if, if you want to. Um, so, you know, take this opportunity to chat to our visitors as well as talking about the subject matter, but, you know, about the, the possibilities of, of making a trip to have an exchange with them as well. Um, I think that's also about 15, 20 minutes of presentation. There'll be time for questions after each one as well. Hmm? I thought we were on 25 minutes. All right, 25 minutes <laughs> or less. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Chloe's so the timekeeper. Okay, thanks very much. I'm a postdoctoral researcher in Stellenbosch in South Africa um, and I'm currently visiting Coventry University for two weeks uh, to visit Katarina. We are working a project with stakeholders on how to involve them in the management of alien species. But this morning I will talk about uh, the topic that I work the most in South Africa which is the, manag the management of the family Cactaceae as invasive species. So first of all, I will give a small introduction of the family, and then I will talk about a couple of projects that I have been doing for the last two years. So the family Cactus is a big family of almost 2,000 species, and almost all of them are native from the American continent. There is, oh, sorry. <laughs> there is just one species, which native range might also be extended to South Africa, Madagascar, but the other 1,921 species are just native from the American continent. And they, uh, they have so many benefits for society. So they are used as food and as fodder. They are used to make beer and make jellies and jams. They are used in the health and com uh, cosmetic industry. They are used as living fences, probably not in the UK. Um, and they are really popular as ornamental species. So due to all this popularity, they have been highly introduced outside the native range. And we estimate that at least 200 At least 200, maybe this. At least 200 species have been introduced outside the native range, probably more. Um, and due to all these introductions, at least 57 species are already recorded as invasive outside the native range. In all these areas, um, the hot spots of invasions are Spain, South Africa, and Australia. And their cactus species have many negative impacts. So they impact natural, natural areas and native animals, but they also have economical impacts because they prevent the access to the land. So for farmers and for the livestock, it's um, really negative. Also, they have negative impacts in the pets and humans and vehicles and so on. So it's a big, a big issue. So we have a spiny situation. We have many positive impacts, many negative impacts, and we have to do something about it. So the first thing that we decided to do was a global study as well as an impact assessment to understand what was the situation of the whole family um, globally. So basically, with the global study, we wanted to find what, what traits were making the species invasive and what reasons and so on. So one of the things that we did was to divide the whole family in 12 row forms. 
A part of this, we also collect all the information available uh, in bold about the genetics of the species and reveal the phylogeny. And we also collect information in, of the IUCN about what species were vulnerable, endangered, and critically endangered in the native range, because this is a big thing with cactus in the native range. So once we did all of this, we tried to find out if there was any pattern with invasiveness, and we found actually that there are some growth forms, as these ones here, um, that they don't have any species considered as invasive. The same with the phylogeny, we have the second clade here with no species recorded as invasive, so these red lines indicate where there are invasive species. And the same with the IUCN categories, those species recorded as vulnerable, endangered, and critical endangered in the native range were not considered as invasive anyway. And the most important thing and really interesting is that those species with these growth forms in the second clade and vulnerable, endangered, and critical endangered in the native range are actually the most popular species in the ornamental trade. So it's the higher propagal pressure and there are no invasions at all. So there is a pattern there of potential invasive or not. And then with the impact assessment, what we did was to apply the generic, the generic impact scoring system, the GISS, um, that you basically categorize all the impacts that are available in the literature about the species. And then we try to link these impact scores with different traits. And what the most important result that we had was that the native range was affecting a lot the impact of the cactus species. So here we have the impact scores, and here the native range size. The crosses are those species that are heavily introduced outside the native range, but they didn't become invasive at all. And then the dots are those species that they became invasive. So we can see that those species with the small native ranges, they don't become invasive, but also the ones that do become invasive, the higher the, uh, the impact score, the larger the native range size. So we already start to look at patterns, so we already can at least answer a little bit this question, which species are potentially invasive and which ones not. So for those that are not potentially invasive, for now we don't have to do anything about them. Then we can in the future reassess all of this, but for now we don't have to do anything. But for those that are potentially invasive, then we have another problem here. <coughs> and is that, as I said before, we have many stakeholders that are positively affected by the cactus, and many stakeholders that are negatively affected. So we have a conflict of interest here. So the, what we decided to do before to start with the management was to identify and involve all the relevant stakeholders with this family. So basically we had, um, we identified, as I said before, many stakeholders that use the cactus for several reasons. And then as negatively affected, we have many stakeholders that are negatively affected by cactus species. So farmers, owners of game reserves, and so on. And then we put all of them together in the same room. And this was... Interesting. <laughs> so we had a workshop uh, where representation of each stakeholder group, they were giving talks about the perceptions about cactus species. So we had people talking about how good that cactus were for animal feed and for using them as a crop and for the nurseries. But we also had people talking about how bad cactus were for their game reserves or the managers talking about how difficult it is to manage them and so on. And one of the things that we did in this workshop was to ask them before the workshop uh, to give us three words that come to their mind, the first, about cactus species, and then rate them. So three really positive and minus three really negative. So for example, beautiful flowers, that will be a three, or horrible spines, that will be a minus three. So this question before the, before the workshop came up like this. The stakeholders that like cactus, they have really positive words, and the stakeholders that are negatively affected by the cactus, negative words. But after the workshop, after the talks and the discussions and so on, these perceptions came a little bit closer. So this was already interesting. And actually, after, after these talks, we had a second workshop where we started to talk about management options all together, and it was really successful. So now we can already start with management, because the stakeholders are already engaged with us. And of course, when we talk about management of invasive species, we talk about prevention, eradication, control, and restoration actions. As I said before, this is a family of almost 2,000 species, and 57 are already invasive, but more species are becoming invasive every year. So for us, the most important action was the prevention, so we work more on that, but we also need a little bit of the other three actions, and I will talk about that later. So prevention. Um, as I said, with the global study and impact assessment, already we had an idea about what the species were potentially invasive. So we did a list of all those species that we thought that they shouldn't be introduced into the country because they could be invasive and so. 
And then with this list, we went to the Cactus Working Group. So the Cactus Working Group is a group of um, stakeholders related to management of cactus species, just management. Um, so we have uh, people from the government, and we have people <coughs> from um, managers and scientists and so on. And we present them this list um, of potentially invasive species, and we discuss the list to arrive to, a, to another list that could be suitable for regulating into the country. And then with this final list that we did all together, we send it to all the stakeholders this time, to the nursery people and to all the people that were using cactus and also the negative effect. <coughs> and they signed the, the letter and we send it to the government. And actually it was really successful and now this list is the one that is regulated in the country. And I think the, the, the reason why it was successful it was for all the involvement of all the stakeholders. Um, so now we have this list and we thought, okay, we, we were successful with prevention of cactus species, but it was not like this exactly. So we had to look at the ornamental tree. Sorry. So the ornamental trade, we had a look at the ornamental trade of cactus species in South Africa, and we saw that there are at least 75 nurseries working with cactus. So it's quite a big trade. And these nurseries look something like this. So there are many, many, many plants in each of these nurseries. And actually, this is me. So you can see like, the size of this nursery. Okay? So when we saw that, we thought, OK, it's impossible. We cannot regulate this. Um, and the, the main thing is that when you think in a normal nursery, uh, you have all your plants with a label, so you know the species that you are buying. But with cactus species, it's not exactly like this. And if you're lucky, you're going to have something like a small cacti, but here actually is a mix between cacti and non-cacti, succulents, even native succulents, so we are mixed. Um, if you're even luckier, you're going to have something like this, with eyes and hats. <laughs> <laughs> and if you're in Christmas, maybe something like this. But there are not really labels. Um, so how can we do this? Um, we decided to talk more with all these nurseries, so the 75 nurseries. And after some coffees and some beers, <laughs> they start to talk with us. And actually, we start to understand how everything was working. And there were just six nurseries in the country that they were introducing cactus from outside, growing them from seeds. And then when the, when, when the cactus was a little bit big, then they were selling them to the other 75 nurseries. So everything was a little bit narrow. Now you will just have six nurseries. So it was better. But still, these are the six nurseries. So once again, we have the big problem. And the main thing is that the people of these nurseries, they order every year seeds of different species of cactus, but the way to order them is like, please send me cactus that they have red flowers and yellow flowers and whatever. So no, they don't know what the species they have. So how can we regulate this? Um, we were thinking in doing maybe genetic things, but then there is not enough money in the world to <laughs> analyze all these plants. Um, so we decided to talk more with them and let's see with them if we could find a solution for this. And actually, it turned out that it was really easy, because there was just one nursery in the Netherlands. Um, there was a woman from Peru that in Peru she had this huge farm uh, where she was growing all these ornamental plants. And every year, she was just collecting the seeds of cactus, sending them to Holland, and from there she was selling them all around the world. And all the six nurseries in South Africa, they were just buying the seeds from this only nursery. So we went to visit them. And we just had now one key player, so it was... Um, much better than at the beginning. Um, and it turned out that this woman was really keen to collaborate with us. She didn't know that the, some of the species could be invasive. Um, and she was really happy to be able to do something about it. So nowadays we are in collaboration with her all the time. And when she has a new plant, she asks us if it's OK, that plant or not. So it's really good. Um, so what we did was to buy seeds of the 300 species this time that she was, well, with varieties and stuff. So 300 different varieties of cactus that she was trading with. Some of them invasive, just few of them, and most of them non-invasive or not potentially invasive. So we wanted to see if we can identify them easily. So we, we decided to do barcoding with it. So we sent to the Canadian Center of DNA Barcoding sample, DNA samples to see if we can identify these species. And it was not successful at all. Barcoding is not enough to be able to identify cactus seeds. So then we went to the next step. And we decided to collect data, all the data that we could about these seeds. So weight, size, form, color, brilliant surface, as much as we can. can, can sorry. And then we found out a really nice, uh, really nice results. That it was just with the seed mass and the seed size, we could differentiate between invasive and non-invasive species. 
So this is really good for the ports of entry. If seeds of cactus are arriving, just be, with the mass and the size, we can identify if they, are, they should be introduced or not. Um, so we are trying to, to apply this for the value security in South Africa and how hopefully if it's successful we could extend it to another places. So that's about the ornamental trade and we thought already we have a list of, prevent of species that we cannot introduce, we know how to identify them and everything is solved. But we still have one problem that it was all this other industry. So the species that are used for food and for fodder and to so many other applications is mainly Opuntia ficus indica, the pretty bird. And this species is, has many, many benefits, so of course it was introduced all over the world. But this is a picture of Australia, how it was before. So it was like a really, really big problem. It became really invasive. Luckily, um, some people found a biocontrol agent that it was really successful, and this problem was solved. However, this species is still really beneficial, so people still want to use it. But luckily, there was an uh, owner of a nursery in California, uh, Luther Burbank, that he developed a new variety of Opuntia ficus indica. So he hand, pollinate, hand pollination, he um, mixed the pollen of different uh, varieties of Opuntia ficus indica, and he came up with a non-spiny one, the cactus pear. So with this, all this success, it was introduced all over the world, of course. And this is one example of South Africa. We have a South African cactus pear growers association, and this is really common in so many countries around the world. So it's perfect, we have many benefits, the species doesn't become invasive because without the spines the animals can eat it and it's so easy to control, so no problem. Um, actually in the University of the Free State in South Africa there is a group of people, really good group of people that they are doing research in all the uses that you can have about this, this variety. Um, and then in the national regulations that I mentioned before, Opuntia ficus indica is listed, but the spineless cultivars are not listed, so you can use them. So until here, everything is fine. However, this is an example of a farm in Spain. Um, you see the, the size of these farms with Opuntia ficus indica, the spineless cultivar. And many times we realize that many animals are eating these fruits. So this is an example with baboons in South Africa, but in, in South Africa it's baboons, elephants, and then we have many birds eating the fruits, many mammals in Spain, in Australia, and so on, eating the fruits. So we were thinking like, this species was just with hand pollination and suddenly we have this variety without the spines, so, but what happened if these seeds now that they are dispersed, they germinate again, so they come back to the spiny variety. So I went to the University of the Free State and they were really keen to, uh, to let me take samples of all the varieties that are used of spiders uh, cactus pear. And um, we came out with nine different varieties. We took samples of all of them. We also took samples of spiny uh, varieties that they were invading around the area. And then as part of the project of Bujo, we did this germination experiment where we germinate all these seeds in different conditions. And the seeds started to germinate, and they started to grow, and they started to grow more, and all of them they were spiny, the ones that germinated. So that, that was not so nice to see that, that result, and we realized that they do revert to spiny, so we have to be really careful with it. But luckily, we have so many different varieties that they can be used. And the results of each of the variety was really different. Like, this is for germination, but for growth and survival was the same. So we have some varieties like Nudosta, that the germination, per, like, it's huge germination and grow really fast and stuff. But then we have another variety, that rosa, that it was impossible to germinate. Even in changing the conditions, perfect conditions, it was impossible. So then we thought that it would be really good to just try to regulate this and allow some of the varieties and not another one. So with that, the things could be a little bit better. So that's about prevention. Now I, I finish about prevention. Um, about eradication. We have a really nice example, which was Opuntia pubescens. It just became invasive. This is the botanical garden of Pretoria. So it, it just became invasive recently. So we thought that it would be a really good target species to try to, to understand how the eradication programs can be done with cactus. So we tried to, to do um, um, like establish a technique about how to eradicate it and send the uh, eradication groups to the botanical garden and try to do it. And the problem is that um, people go there and take off the plants, mechanical control, and they, they also apply um, herbicides. But then, when you come back two months later, the plants are there. And it's because if you leave a small piece of the plant, then this is going to be a new plant. So we are trying to figure out how to, 
how to do this. Well, it's a still a project ongoing to understand if we can really do eradication of cactus species easily. And then the other one was control. Control of cactus species are done mostly with um, chemical control and biological control. The biological control is the most effective one, um, but we don't have enough biocontrol agents for all the species. So we are still doing something with this. Like last year, we went to, to Mexico to try to find new biocontrol agents for the Indropuntia species, that is the genus that is being the big problem now in South Africa. But the problem, of course, we found many biocontrol agents, but it's going to take a while, some years, to try until you can introduce these biocontrol agents again. And then finally about restoration. Um, so there was many, many reasons research being done in control of cactus species and so on, but we don't know what happened after we control them. So we use the example of Opuntia stricta, which was a species introduced as ornamental plant to Kruger National Park in South Africa, and really soon it became a big problem. This is an example of Kruger National Park. So the whole bush was completely covered with Opuntia stricta. Um, luckily with chemical control and biological control, it was control really easily, and nowadays these areas look like this. You, you have a couple of small plants, but people is still putting biocontrol agents uh, regularly, so the problem is under control now. So we decided to look at the legacy effects that this invasion would have. So now that it's under control, let's see if there are still environmental impacts or socioeconomical impacts. And we look at all these list of different impacts from plant biodiversity and soil nutrient cycles and control costs and stuff. And we found out that there are a couple of legacy effects on soil microbial biodiversity, biodiversity, but nothing serious. A couple of control costs that is regarded to put the biocontrol every once in a while, and a couple of tourists that they are complaining if they see a plant, but nothing really serious. So then it's really good that if we manage to control the cactus, then the problem is quite solved. Um, yes, the last thing about management. Um, uh, as I said before, we have three hot spots of, inv of cactus invasions. So we did uh, one book two years ago just to see with one of the species that is a big problem in these three hot spots and to put all the information together with Spain, South Africa and Australia. And it was really successful because each of us we are doing completely different management actions and we don't, we don't know what the other ones are doing. And it was really nice to see what the other ones are doing and try to apply it in a different country. So as part of the MAPI conference last year in September, we organized a symposium where people from different countries with problems with cactus invasions uh, came. And we were discussing many things. We also established a global working group on the management of alien cactus species. So now we are kind of organized to learn from each other. And one of the actions that we are doing now is we develop um, a questionnaire about management of cactus species. Uh, we target managers with that to send all, all over the place in those areas with cactus invasion. So this questionnaire is in English and Spanish in Portuguese, in French, um, I think, and in Italian. And we are now sending it around to all the managers of cactus invasions. And that's all. <laughs> no. And thank you so much. Um, I would like to thank, of course, my supervisors in South Africa and my funders. Without them, of course, it would be impossible. And Catalina and Chloe for having me here this week. <laughs>
Um, you mean how difficult it is to control it? No, I mean, in terms of uh, resilience, because uh, some crops are, uh, because of extreme weather conditions, some crops are, uh, are not likely to, uh, you know, to grow on a special scale like uh, I, I saw uh, on the map, uh, I will see few uh, the areas marked in these uh, cactus. So I just want to find out how is it mm -hmm. you see to extreme weather in the first mm -hmm. um, The areas where, where the nurseries are, so it's not where the, where the inventions um, are mostly, so it's just those, those places where the nurseries of ornamental cactus species are based. Um, there are some places that the cactus don't do really well, like in the Western Cape, it's not a big problem uh, because of um, environmental conditions, they cannot do really well. Um, in the rest of the country, um, so most of the cactus invasions are in this area um, because of the weather, of course. It's the Karoo area and it's drier and it's more warm and stuff. Um, for example, in, in this area or in this area, there are not many problems because of the weather. And mostly in this area because in summer there is a lot of rain and when it's warm and there is rain, cactus cannot deal really well with it. So it's mostly this area here. What are the main points where, where, the, where the cactus are, are spreading from? Is it from, from gardens and, and, and how do they do that? Or is it from these plantations where they, yeah, where, where they keep mm -hmm. them and to, to harvest something? Or? Normally it's from all gardens. Um, with seeds or how, how do they get um, it's, it's mostly, mostly um, not, not really with seeds. So we wanted to check that because we didn't find really many birds eating most of the species of cactus, just the Pompeaficus indica. Um, but it's mainly with detached parts of the plant. Uh -huh. So it's ma mainly with animals. The animals walk around, the, a part of the plant gets get attached to the animal, and then this part goes in another way. Uh, for example, the Opuntia pubescens that I explained in Pretoria that we are trying to eradicate it, um, is with the dasis. They are like small mammals, and this plant is small. So the dasis are walking around all the time. And you can see that where the dasis go is exactly where all the cactus are, are going and growing. So <laughs> I think it's mostly animals with the dasis. Right. Um, with the effects of climate change, do you think the native or non-native species will be better able to cope? Uh, it's, it's interesting the climate change with cactus, uh, because due to kind of climate change they are being introduced in many parts of Africa. Um, so it's, it's probable, like, there are many probabilities that they are going to grow better in many areas with the climate change, definitely. And mostly in the center of Africa, um, they are really aware of climate change and they want to, do, to plant a different um, species that they can cope with the conditions, and they are introducing a lot of cactus species, which is quite scary. <laughs> so, yeah. How long was your project? How many years? Um, I have been doing this for three years. For how long? Three years. You've done all that work in three years. Yeah. That is an amazing amount of work. <laughs> Phenomenally <laughs> successful. Absolute heartfelt congratulations. Well done. <laughs> Thank you. What next then? Next, um, next, final job. Final <laughs> job. <laughs> um, I have until the end of the year um, that I still have to publish some of the things that came up from this work. Yeah. And I have a couple of side projects that I have to finish and then final job. Oh, <laughs> so I don't know what's the next thing. That's so much work. <laughs> Thank oh. you so much. <laughs> yeah, in terms of the uh, economic value, uh, is there a potential that uh, cactus becomes? Uh, a plant uh, that would uh, be of importance in, you know, economic, uh, of say, an economic booster or some some countries that mm. get it growing in there. Um, it could be uh, mostly with a <coughs> indica because you can introduce. So before introducing the biocontrol that is really successful, people introduce a different biocontrol that has a lot of carminic acid. So if you introduce this insect. Um, then you can sell the carminic acid, and that is a big, big uh, economical thing. Um, the, that with the carminic acid. About the plant itself, um, the fruits, I don't know if it can become really important because the people don't like it so much. Because you have the plant without the spines, but the fruits have the small spines. So then if you buy the fruits and you bring it home, then you have 
all the all your kitchen full of spines for weeks. <laughs> so people don't like it so much. Um, then with fodder, it's a little bit easier uh, because people plant the, the plant and then there is a machine now uh, that they build. Uh, you pass the cactus to the machine and then it breaks everything apart so the animals can eat it without having problems with the spines. So it might be, but I don't think there are many probabilities that a part of the ornamental trade is going to be a big economic thing. Okay. Well, thank you very much again, Anna. And, uh, <laughs>